Hey everyone, this is Jeff Crawl, math coach for the New Tech Network, and this is problem-based learning. How does it work? Mathematics can be taught several different ways. None of them are truly a silver bullet for education. However, there is one thing that all the educational research points to. The traditional classroom does not work for mathematics instruction. When I say traditional, I'm referring to the typical instruction that goes on in a classroom, where the teacher says, today class, we are learning about slope, followed by a lecture about slope, followed by practice problems about slope. We have scores of data that show that this doesn't work. Whether it's international assessments, percentage of kids going on to mathematics-rich occupations and post-secondary degrees, whatever data you look at suggests that we're not doing a great job educating our kids in mathematics using a traditional approach. Even if you're a good teacher, it doesn't work. Even if your students see a bump in their test scores, it doesn't work. Consider for a moment how silly it is to even teach this way. If we want kids to be good problem solvers and critical thinkers, then the last thing we want to do is give students the recipe before they've even attempted a solution. That approach may have worked for a time in the t a 20th century school system, which mirrored the 20th century factory model, but those days are long gone. And frankly, I'm skeptical that it even worked in the 20th century. I mean, be honest. How often in life are you presented with a problem just after having learned the requisite skill to solve that problem? Which brings us to problem-based learning, which in some sense simply reverses the instructional process in a traditional classroom. Now we've front-loaded the problem and back-loaded the learning. You know, much more how life actually works. This screencast will take a look at what a problem-based learning unit looks like from start to finish. There are five general pieces to a good problem-based learning unit. The posing of the problem, work on the problem, intervention as questions arise, students apply the scaffolded instruction to the problem, a solution is reached. Or PWIZA for short. Okay, maybe no acronyms. But let's take a look at each of these pieces. 1. The problem is posed. Students are given a problem scenario to grapple with. However, this piece of the puzzle does not end here. Unless your students have a preternatural ability and desire to immediately strategize research and set to work on a problem, they'll need some sort of facilitation of this process. And if they do all those things without prompting, please email me when you have a vacancy at your school. Some schools and teachers use the need-to-know process, where te teachers have students come up with a list of things they know about the problem and a list of things that they need to know about the problem. Maybe even more important than that is the next steps piece, where students brainstorm actions they can immediately take toward a solution of the problem as soon as you finish this process. That's great and all, but sometimes it results in knows and need-to-knows that aren't very useful. No, we have to find the area. Need to know, uh, how to find the area. Next steps, ask teacher how to find the area. It'd be great if, as a facilitator of this process, you had an idea of where you wanted the students to go and where the students will probably be at. Try anticipating what the students expected knows and need to knows will be, what desired knows and need to knows you want them to come up with, and a line of questioning to get from here to there. Also, next steps. Here are some potential next steps for your students to suggest. Draw a diagram. Try some numerical values. See if there's a pattern. Try it with a smaller case. Do some online research. Write an equation. Draw a graph. These are all actionable items that students can undertake regardless of their mathematical proficiency. I want to reiterate, though, that these are student-generated next steps. If students do not have ownership of these knows, need-to-knows, and next steps, then there might not even be a reason to do this process. Also, this is merely a protocol for something more important, having students strategize, brainstorm, and take ownership of their instruction. If there's a pro protocol you use in your classroom, I would love to hear about it. Two, students begin working. Now that students have two or three actionable next steps, you can safely let go and have them begin working on the problem. 
At this point, as the facilitator, feel free to float around the room, answer clarifying questions, take a look at student solutions. Be sure to highlight and praise any good mathematical thinking or just plain old go good work you see going on. What a clear graph. What a novel approach. You might want to have some of those big poster post-it thingies on hand. Students tend to write larger when they have more room to write. Then it will allow, allow you to immediately see and assess their work and will allow you to probe for understanding, being sure, everyone in, being sure to ask everyone in each group. What was the thought process behind this? How can we be sure that this is the correct way to solve the problem? Step 3. Intervention. Assuming you've posed a good problem, questions will naturally arise in the classroom. Maybe it's as, as simple as, how do I do this next step, or how can I tell if my answer is right? But let me be clear about the one thing. These questions are where the learning actually is taking place. If you'll allow me to climb on my soapbox for a minute, let's think back to our failed teaching model. This is the model that tells students how to do something before they've ever struggled with the problem. In order to learn something, students must struggle with it. They must be cognitively engaged with a topic or task, and usually takes, that takes place in the form of grappling with a problem. Otherwise, they're just following a recipe. If students aren't actively struggling with a problem, then either A, the task is too easy, B, there was too much front-loaded instruction or pre-teaching of the problem, or C, the problem isn't very engaging. None of these denote a lost cause, but it's something to be aware of. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get back off my soapbox. That's better. So this struggling process is important in and of itself, and so are the intervention strategies you decide to use. You want to provide methodology for students to solve the problem. Now, I'm not totally disregarding the existence of the lecture as an information transmission tool. True, most cognitive research places it just above pantomiming and interpretive dance as effective information delivery systems, but it's one of a menu of options. Consider as an alternative to lecture. Students share out about their work and their peers offer next steps. Students exchange work with the other groups to see their solution strategies. Some kind of manipulative or matching activity. An exploration which links to their problem. Math visualization software like Geometer Sketchpad or GeoGebra. A lab or hint cards. Or better yet, have students decide on the method that they would like to receive the information. That might just make a good summative activity or exit ticket one day. Although, there's a decent chance they'll say, just tell us how to do it. So be aware. Four, we're almost done. Students get back to work and hopefully apply the instruction they've just received. At this point, you might even ask students to refine their work or have groups analyze each other's work. If you employ a rubric or have a student develop rubric, you, they could begin assessing against that, or split up in, into groups and have them share their solutions with students not in their groups. Five, the solution. So the students should arrive at a solution or get assistance from those who have. Now the teacher facilitates the debrief process. Were there any different strategies cho chosen? Were there any moments of ingenuity? How did the scaffolding apply to their solution? Does this problem connect with anything else they've done in this class? What other situations could this apply to? Or, try this two-minute assessment activity. Each student is given a post-it note and asked to write one of the following on it. One thing that could be made better. One thing that you don't want to forget that you learned. One thing that suddenly bec became clear to you, a light bulb moment. Or one thing you still have a question about. The students then place their post-it notes in the requisite quadrant of the grid, potentially as they leave the room. Now, the facilitator can quickly assess what worked, what didn't, and what may need to be redone. Note, this activity also works exceptionally well as a staff activity for professional development. Also at this point, the teacher needs to decide on some of his or her own next steps. Based on student need, should a teacher assign a similar problem? an individual problem set, conduct a follow-up activity, or move on to some sort of new mathematical concept entirely. You can use the student work, 
conversations, or some sort of post-assessment to determine your next steps. So that's the problem-based process in a nutshell. Ideally, the use of a problem-based approach may help develop good problem solvers, while the process of strategizing and trying different approaches may actually help students perform well on standardized tests. As I said earlier, there is no one right way to math instruction. However, whatever approach you utilize, it should involve some sort of problem solving, strategizing, questioning, and formative assessment process. A problem-based approach is one way to potentially achieve those goals. For a more on a problem and inquiry-based approach, you can go to my blog and look at some resources as well as find links to other better blogs that promote the inquiry process. Thanks for listening. Best of luck.